So my topic for today, I want to say greetings from central Pennsylvania, and uh, I'm appreciative of the opportunity to share my, my work. I've been studying these particular authors in Spain and Latin America for a number of years, and I'm now applying a, a behavioral epigenetics uh, concept to their work. So we're going to look at two brothers and magic in 17th century Spanish empire. <clears throat> Hernando Ruiz de Alarcón, who is a graduate of the Royal and Pontifical University in 1606 in theology and scripture, served as a secular parish priest in Atenanco, which was located about 80 miles south of Tosco, where Hernando's Spanish father and maternal grandfather had overseen the work of a silver mine uh, for the Spanish crown. In 1617, Hernando was appointed ecclesiastical judge of the parish of Atenanco by Archbishop Juan Perez de la Serna. It is clear that Hernando Ruiz de Alarcón was a man of good standing with the colonial Roman Catholic Church, enough to be considered for and chosen for this task. It is of interest, however, that in 1614, Hernando Ruiz de Alarcón himself was accused before the Inquisition for abuse of indigenous people. In addition to the honor of being an ecclesiastical judge in 1623, Archbishop Perez de la Serna singled him out to record the ritual practices of the Nahuatl Indians in his area. Over the next five years, he interviewed natives in the Nahuatl language, wrote his observations down and collected them in the book that you see there on the right, treatise on heathen superstitions that today live among the Indians native to this new Spain, 1629. In his prologue and prefatory remarks, Ruiz de Alarcón expresses a modicum of understanding and sympathy for the natives, urging his fellow priests to learn to speak Nahuatl and understand more about their practices. However, he reveals antagonistic feelings in a preamble to the first treatise, using the following words to describe the natives he has encountered as ignorant, naive, deceitful, packed with the devil, witch, and sorcerer. Over five years, he was able to collect approximately 74 incantations, superstitions, invocations, and ritual practices from surrounding communities of Nahua speakers. His brother, Juan Ruiz de Alarcón, was also educated at the Royal and Pontifical University in Mexico City, but in canon law, continuing his education in civil law at the University of Salamanca, Spain. He completed the requirements there for a licentiate in civil and canon law, which he received by petition in 1609 from the Royal and Pontifical University on a return visit to Mexico. Juan worked for a time as a lawyer in Mexico and tried twice unsuccessfully for a university position in Mexico City. He finally opted in 1613 to, retain, to return to Spain, settling there in Madrid. His first play, The Walls Have Ears, was produced in 1617, and he went on to become a prominent playwright in, uh, of the Spanish Golden Age. And what you see on the right there is his uh, comedias, his plays were collected. This is the first part of his comedias. There are two volumes. Juan devised ways to bring his audiences to moral consideration by presenting complex and interesting characters with human flaws, by directing their attention to human foibles through action, by employing humor, and often by entertaining and enticing them with magic. For some reason, my slide won't advance. Sorry. Uh, there we go. There's not a lot of information about the everyday life of the Ries de Alarcón brothers. Their, their parents and maternal grandparents were involved in managing a silver mine near Real de Taxco, having been some of the earliest settlers in New Spain around 1540. This is a, just an idea of the topography of Taxco. The family lived in Taxco for a time and then relocated to the city of Mexico, 
which then had a population of about a million to one and a half million people. Uh, the mines were producing less silver, but it's probable that the family traveled back and forth between the Tosco mines and Mexico City as the grandparents and uncle still lived near the mine. This is the picture of a, a, an ex hacienda now, um, but a hacienda San Juan de Bautista near Tosco. This particular hacienda was used to refine silver um, in the 16th century, but silver mining in Mexico was difficult, dangerous, and an unhealthy occupation. The Ruiz de Alarcón brothers surely observed this process. Since they most likely did not think of medical or environmental issues, it might have seemed somewhat magical to begin with black rocks and end up with silver. And the miners, the maternal grandfather, Hernando, the father, Pedro, the maternal uncle, Gaspar, became at the time magicians who took silver from the bowels of the earth, as well as demons who tormented the Indians and mules. A hallucinatory reality that could have slipped through the cracks of the playwright's memory into some of his plays. Hernando and Juan both grew up surrounded not only by the pain produced by the Spanish conquerors, but also by the fullness of a culture that they did not belong to, but surely observed daily, whether they were in Mexico City or the Tosco area. Because the brothers were born in New Spain, the mixing of cultures was not strange to them. The lives of Spaniards, Criollos, and indigenous people were inextricably intertwined. H.B. H. B. Nicholson noted that one of the most striking features of pre-Hispanic Mesoamerica was the particularly pervasive role played by religion and magic. Supernatural and ritual practice permeated nearly every significant cultural activity. Christianity itself took on a dis distinctive cast in indigenous peoples in that indigenous peoples saw no contradiction in practicing Christian and pre-Columbian traditions side by side, which is what you see here in this picture is a sculpture with the indigenous people and also the Spanish priest worshiping the Virgin Mary. So behavioral epigenetics studies the ways that interactions between humans and their environment can actually change genomes. These changes help explain the nature versus nurture conundrum or how twins or siblings can be so different although they share similar or the same DNA. It seems to, it seeks to understand how a person becomes a unique self. David S. Moore commented on epigenetics research, quote, what has made recent research on epigenetics so exciting is the discovery that the environments in which we develop, how we are nurtured, can influence the epigenetic state of our DNA and therefore whom we become. And here you see ep epigenetics with nurture and nature. So um, this particular figure I thought was interesting because it really shows you the relationship between genes, cells, tissue, and the environment. And each of those categories would be working back and forth in uh, interacting directly and indirectly with the neighbors and all other levels. So I'd like to take a look at Hernando, the one brother, in his written words and actions. So what he did throughout his life was persecute indigenous peoples in his parish, practiced exceptionalism, Spaniards first, acted with the authority of the papal doctrine of discovery, used the power and doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church to convert individuals, denied the worth of indigenous magical customs and religion, rejected natural healing practices, and reported errant behavior to his superiors. His brother, Juan, in his words, used the magic of the theater to educate and entertain his audiences, used magic to play on the fears and superstitions of his audiences, though condemning it. And I have wicker after these because that's where I got these three ideas. Used magical effects to illustrate a moral lesson. Used magic as dramatic turning point that solved a dilemma 
showed empathy in the treatment of his characters, used the stage to criticize the inequities of his day. Although loyal to the king, he critiqued life at court. So how did individual environments alter this thinking? We have one person who persecutes magic and we have one person who uses magic. Hernando was tracked very early for the priesthood. Juan had a significant and obvious disability as a double hunchback. Um, he was probably had special treatment at home. He was not considered for the priesthood because from the 1200s on, priests were expected to be perfect in body in order to approach um, the chancel of the church. Hernando was educated at a university for criollos who were uh, people who were born of Spanish parents in the New World. And Juan was educated at two different universities. Hernando stayed within the orthodoxy of the Roman Catholic Church and successfully pursued advancement within the Catholic system. Juan successfully pursued advancement at a national level in Spain uh, and toward the end of his life was able to accept a uh, position on the Council of the Indies from the king. Hernando never traveled outside of New Spain. Juan traveled uh, to and lived in Spain and also traveled back and forth twice between the two countries. Hernando lived in the same remote area nearly his whole life. Juan interacted with many different people as a student, lawyer, traveler, and author. My conclusions are that the science of behavioral epigenetics validates my observations that the Ruiz de Alarcón brothers began in the same environment, but grew apart in philosophy and actions due to their diverse lived experiences because social interactions can cause epigenetic changes. Individual experiences can cause epigenetic changes. Genes do not dictate who we are going to be they guide our development. And in the end, who we are depends on nature, nurture, and epigenetics. And these are my references. Thank you.